perspective. Today, the topic for discussion is Lagrange multiplier theory and the problem that we would like to solve is I want to minimize a function fx such that h of x is equal to zero and x is in Rn. Okay, and h of x is h1 of x all the way to h m of x. So there are m such functions. Okay, each of these hi is a function from Rn to R. Okay, so this is the problem that we want to solve. So let's look at it pictorially. I have one function, this is my h of x equals to zero. I have another function. Oh, this is h1 of x, this is h2 of x equals to zero. And this is the intersection. So at the red line, I have h of x equals to zero. So both h1 of x and h2 of x, both of them are zero, where these two planes are in, these two uh, surfaces are intersecting. Okay, and I want to minimize this function f of x over just this particular set. Only within this set, I want to minimize this function um, f of x. Is the picture clear? Let me remove this, yeah. And okay, so this is the curve. This is the curve at which the two surfaces are intersecting and I want to minimize the function along this curve. So as always, like we have done for uh, the, the unconstrained optimization and optimization over convex set, the first thing we would like to discuss is the necessary conditions for optimality and the sufficient conditions for optimality. Okay, any questions so far? All right, so let's talk about, uh, so before we talk about necessary conditions, I need to uh, uh, define a specific term. So let me define it right here. So we say that X is regular if gradient of H1 of X, gradient of HM of X are linearly independent. Okay, so we want the derivatives. So these are all the constraints and we want the derivatives evaluated at that point X to be uh, linearly independent of each other. What does that mean for this particular picture? So what's the gradient of h1 at a point x. So let's say I pick a point x. Uh, let's say I pick a point x here. This is my x. And what's the gradient of h1 of x? So if you have a surface, what does the gradient of um, the equation defining the surface looks like.
no idea well usually not usually uh, whenever you have h1 of x equal to zero, 0 and you're looking at that surface and you have a point on that surface the gradient is always going to be an outward normal so this is what the gradient of h1 of x is going to look like okay so what's about gradient of h2 of x so gradient of h2 of x will be the outward normal of this particular surface h2 of x so that's this this is the gradient of h2 of x do you think these two vectors are linearly independent no yes can't say uh, yes uh, they are linearly independent okay uh, why would you say that they are linearly independent uh, because uh, if they are dependent if they would have been linear dependent they would have been parallel to each other correct great 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 yeah so that's the geometric picture i was looking for so if they were linearly dependent they both would be pointing towards the same direction. So in this case, we have only two vectors. So therefore, they are linearly independent in this case because they are all pointing towards different direction. All right, so this point is regular. So let's look at a situation where we have a non-regular point. So I have my R2 and I have one circle and I'm going to draw a smaller circle inside it. And these two circles are touching exactly at this point. So there's only one feasible point, which is this point. This is the only point X where the two constraints are valid. So this is H1 of X equal to zero. This is H2 of X equal to zero. So as I had mentioned, the gradient of H1 of X will be outward normal in this case. So let me draw it. Um, so this is what the gradient of H1 of X looks like. And this is what the gradient of H2 of X looks like. So in other words, these two gradients are pointing in the same direction. And therefore, in this case, X is not regular questions okay so in this case you'd look at you looked at the gradient of the two surfaces and they are all they they are both are parallel to each other in which case the point X is not regular. Whereas in this case, the two gradients are pointing in different direction and therefore the point X is regular. So we require in the case of necessary condition, uh, we'll require that the gradients are pointing in different direction or more mathematically, they should be linearly independent. Okay, so the point of the, the concept of regularity is clear now. No questions on this. So we are now ready to talk about necessary condition. And this theorem is called KKT theorem. Karush Kun Tucker theorem, KKT theorem. So what does this theorem says? It says if X star is optimal or min local minimum is a local minimum and regular point, then there exists lambda one star all the way to lambda M star. These are all scalars. So they could take positive or negative value. So there exists lambda one to lambda m star 
such that Okay, so this is the first order necessary condition, FONC, for the constrained optimization problem. Let's talk about the second order necessary condition. So I'm going to define, define the set of first order feasible variations so v of x star which is d in r n such that gradient of h i x star transpose d is equal to zero for all i So the second order necessary condition is D transpose This is the second order necessary condition. For all D in Vx star. Okay, so if x star is a local minimum and is a regular point, so regularity is required for the equations to hold. So if x star is a local minimum and x star is a regular point, then there exists a set of uh, scalars, lambda one star all the way to lambda m star, such that the first order necessary condition hold and you define the set of first order feasible variation, which I'm going to talk about pretty soon, what that, what this uh, V of X star is. If you look at the set of first order feasible variations, then the second derivative uh, of the function plus uh, the second derivative of constraints multiplied by the corresponding Lagrange multiplier, that should have uh, D transpose that should satisfy D transpose this matrix multiplied by D should be non negative only for D and VX star. So it's not required for all D in RN, but only for D in the first order feasible variation set. Perfect. So let's look at what exactly is the set of first order feasible variations. So let's, for simplicity, let's assume that we have only one I. So So this is my h1 of x equal to zero. So I have i equals to one, that's it. Uh, and I pick a point, let's say this is my x star. What's the uh, gradient of hi at x star or h1 at x star? So that's going to be the outward normal. So this is my gradient of h1 x star. 
what do you think is the set of all d that is normal or orthogonal to the first derivative at x star? What's the set of all d such that this transpose d is equal to zero? The tangent to the right. So all the directions that are tangent to the surface at x star. That's great. So I look at the tangent to the surface. I get this whole bunch of vectors. They are all orthogonal to this particular vector gradient of h1 x star. So gradient of h1 x star is pointing normal to the surface. And so the tangent to the surface are all the vectors that are normal orthogonal to the gradient of h1 x star. So this is the set v of x star, the first order feasible variations. Okay, make sense? All right, so now let's talk about what happens when we have two surfaces intersecting with one another. Okay, so let me redraw the same picture again. So I have, this is my surface one. This is my surface two. This is my H2 of X equals to zero. H1 of X equals to zero. And this is my intersection of these two surfaces. And this is my point X star. And I look at the first order feasible variation. So that has to be orthogonal to this vector, which is gradient of H1 X star. And it has to be orthogonal to this vector, which is gradient of H2 X star. So what set of vectors are orthogonal to these two vectors, gradient of H1 X star and gradient of H2 X star? So the vectors along the, the x-bar. Right, so it's the, it's the set of vectors that are along this line. So it will be this vector and this vector. So these are v of x star. So in this case, v of x star contains only two uh, set of vectors, one which is pointing in that direction and one which is pointing in exactly the opposite direction. Okay, and that's because h of x equal to zero is actually just a, I shouldn't say a line, but uh, it's like a curved line. Yeah, so curved line is probably better. So it's not a line, but it's a curved line. And so the set of first order feasible variations is just sliding along those, it is sort of tangent to that particular curved line at X star. Okay, so that's the meaning of first order feasible variations. Okay, so now that you understand V of X star and you understand what the gradient of H1 X star and H2 X star looks like, let's go back and look at what the theorem is saying. Any, any question on the first order feasible variation? So one of these two figures. No questions. So let's look at what this necessary condition is saying. So it says that for some choice of lambda one star to lambda m star, the gradient of fx star becomes linearly de dependent with the gradient of hi x star. Okay, so if I can rewrite that equation again, that equation is gradient of fx star equals to summation minus lambda i h i x star i equals one to m. So you see, we, we know what the gradient of h i x star looks like. That's this line and that's this line. 
And what this KKD theorem is saying is look, the gradient of fx star actually has to lie within the span of gradient of hi x star. And so if I am at x star here, and this is my gradient of h1, and this is my gradient of h2, my gradient of f will be, and this is the h of x equals to zero, my gradient of f will be in this plane spanned by gradient of h1 and h2. So that would be this curve played here and my gradient of f at x star will be within this plane. Let me make it in a different color. And remember that this plane is actually orthogonal to this particular line. Okay. You can also write it. Is there another way to write the same, same expression? Uh, in, in, in terms of the first order feasible variation. So remember the first order feasible variation is orthogonal to gradient of H1 and gradient of H2. So the other way to write it is gradient of F of X star transpose D is equal to zero for all D in B of X star. It's the same thing. Okay, so the gradient of the function is orthogonal to all the first order feasible variations at x star, or it lies in the same plane as the uh, plane spanned by gradient of h1, gradient of h2, all the way up to gradient of hm. So this is the famous uh, KKT theorem. Any, any question on this result? We will go over the proof in the next class, but today I want to cover the necessary condition and sufficient condition. All right. Okay. So there is a compact way of writing the necessary condition for optimality, which is by introducing what is known as Lagrangian. Okay. So L is a function from Rn cross Rm to R, and it is defined by L of X comma Lambda. So now Lambda is a vector. This is defined by FX plus Lambda transpose H of X. This is known as Lagrangian. Okay, so the first order necessary condition can now be written as so this is gradient with respect to L, gradient with respect to X, evaluated at X star lambda star is equal to zero, and H of X star is equal to zero. 
So X star is optimal and regular, which means of course H of X star has to be equal to zero because X belongs to the constraint set. And the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to X has to be equal to zero. And if you think a little bit carefully, it turns out that H of X star can be written as gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to lambda. Now in the vector notation, this will be equal to lambda star. Okay, any questions so far? So this is the first order necessary condition. And the second order necessary condition would be D transpose second derivative only with respect to X of L of X star lambda star D is greater than equal to zero for all D in BX star. Okay, so by introducing this function L we can truly simplify the expressions quite a lot. We can just talk about the first derivative of Lagrangian being equal to zero. And the second derivative of Lagrangian um, should satisfy the D transpose second derivative D greater than equal to zero for all first order feasible variations. Okay. Let us now talk about sufficient conditions for optimality. So the theorem is as follows. Okay. So suppose X bar in Rn, Rn, lambda bar is in Rm, such that the first so gradient with respect to x of the Lagrangian is equal to zero, gradient with respect to lambda of the Lagrangian, which is equal to H of X bar is equal to zero. So X bar lies on the constraint and the first derivative of the Lagrangian at X bar vanishes. dx bar d not equal to zero.
then x bar is optimal is is a local minimum and lambda bar is the corresponding oh i can't really say whether that it's a lagrange multiplier because x bar may not be regular so let me not write this part of course in in most situations x bar is uh, regular and therefore lambda bar would be the corresponding lagrange multiplier but i can't make that claim here because i haven't assumed x bar to be regular Okay, so this is the sufficient conditions for optimality. I need two vectors here. One is x bar and lambda bar. X bar must be on the constraint surface, so h of x bar must be equal to zero. Uh, the first derivative with respect to Lagrangian must vanish at x bar comma lambda bar. So this first derivative of Lagrangian takes as input both x bar and lambda bar. And then the second derivative at x bar lambda bar must satisfy this expression. So it has to be strictly positive for all d that is in the first order feasible variations, but d is not equal to zero. In which case we can safely conclude that x bar is a local minimum. In fact, what you can also show that f of x is greater than or equal to f of x star plus some gamma over two norm of x minus x star square. For, for x close to x star and gamma is some positive constant. is a constant. Okay, let's let's uh, think about the uh, unconstrained optimization case um, and remember the sufficient condition there. So the sufficient condition, so in that situation, H was zero. And in that situation, uh, we had that the first derivative should be equal to zero. And the second derivative of the function must be positive definite, which automatically implies that D transpose second derivative of function D will be positive for D in Rn, okay? so. So we recover the sufficient conditions for optimality uh, for the unconstrained optimization case just by uh, this particular result. Okay, except that in the case of unconstrained optimization, V of X bar was entire Rn, but in the case of constrained optimization, which is what we are considering here, V of X bar is just a subset of Rn. It's not the entire set Rn. Any question on the necessary conditions for optimality or sufficient conditions for optimality? So is there an upper bound on the gamma, the constant gamma? Oh, uh, this gamma is related to the eigenvalues of the second derivative of the Lagrangian. So, 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 so there exists, so it should say basically there exists gamma greater than zero such that f of x is greater than f of x star plus gamma over two x minus x star. But uh, but the upper bound on gamma would depend on the eigenvalues of the second derivative of Lagrangian and the first order feasible directions at x okay. bar. Yeah. 
any other question as always uh, when we will run algorithms for uh, solving this constraint optimization problems uh, we will always converse to a point which satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality and it is left up to us to determine whether the second order sufficiency condition is met or not uh, in order to guarantee that x bar or whatever point we converse to would be a local minimum so this is the same as first order necessary condition but this is not the same as second order necessary condition okay so let's uh, go ahead and try and prove the necessary conditions for optimality And this is the only proof we will cover. We won't cover the proof for sufficient conditions for optimality. Okay. So I am going to uh, introduce some of the notations today and we'll complete the rest of the proof in the next class on friday so this is the constraint surface h of x equals to zero here is my point x star and let me draw an epsilon ball centered at x star so this is i'm going to use s which is the set X and Rn such that norm of X minus X star less than equal to epsilon. So this is less than equal to, okay? So don't forget this equal to sign. And I know that X star is optimal uh, or local minimum along the surface HX equal to zero. And we know that X star is regular, which means that the gradient of H1X all the way to HMX are, are linearly independent. So we know X star local minimum. And we know that gradient of H1 of X star, gradient of HM of X star are linearly independent. These two things are given. Let me define a function FK of X to be equal to FX plus K over two norm of hx square plus uh, x minus x star square and i'm going to put alpha over two here alpha is some positive numbers so alpha is greater than zero k is in the space of natural numbers. Okay. And naturally, x is in Rn. So I'm basically defining this function fk of x over this entire sphere S. And I am going to define xk as the optimal value of this function fk of x over x in this set S. So XK is the optimal point of FK within this set capital S. Okay. 
Okay. So what I have is for every K, I have an X1, X2, X3 and so on. So this would be my, this is my X1, this is my X2, this is my X3, X4, X5, X6. Okay. I have this whole sequence X1 to X infinity available to me and they all lie in the set capital S. So what does that imply? I have XK, K equals one to infinity. This all lies in a compact set. So this is a closed and bounded set. Okay, so what does this imply? Can someone tell me what happens when we have a sequence in a closed and bounded set? Convex. Sorry? It's convex. Uh, I mean, the set S is convex, uh, that's right, but uh, something happens when you have a sequence in a closed and bounded set. Oh, the limit, the limit belongs to the set. Sorry, the limit? The limit, like it converges to the set. Right, so the limit converges to the set because it's a closed set, but this is not a convergent sequence yet. Okay. Okay, so one of the things we studied in the very beginning of this class was when you have a closed and bounded set and you pick a sequence within that set, then there exists a convergent subsequence. Convergent sub sequence. Yeah. I'm going to denote that convergence of sequence by X K L. L equals to one to infinity and this converges, let's say to X bar, some point in the set X bar, which is as someone rightly pointed out, it's in the set capital S itself because capital S is closed. So X bar must lie within this set. Okay. So we are going to now go through some very intricate uh, mathematical arguments which will show that this x bar is actually equal to x star okay so we are going to claim that xk converges to x star okay that's our claim number one and then in claim number two we will show that Gradient of fk xk, uh, this is equal to zero, and because we can, we know that xk converges to x star, uh, we'll be able to take the limit of this, and we will arrive at the first order necessary condition for optimality, and and then we will use. the second derivative condition because we will have unconstrained minimum of the second derivative of fk and we will arrive at the second order necessary conditions for optimality. So these three arguments uh, will be quite intricate and it will take quite a bit of time. Uh, so we'll go over it one by one. And if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me at that moment itself and ask me because uh, the arguments are going to be complicated. So if you have a question, it's quite likely that someone else in the class also will have the same question. Okay. So let's try about 
so let's try and think about claim one. So claim one says, well, XK itself converges to X star. So in order to prove this claim, the first thing we need to show is that X bar it's, itself is equal to X star. So let's, uh, let's think about that. So I have FK of XK, of course it is the minimum, so it must be less than FK of X star. Okay, since XK is a local minimum. And X star also belongs to the set capital S. So what does this imply? I have F of XK plus K over two H of XK square plus alpha over two XK minus X star square is less than equal to F of X star. I'm going to name this equation one for the time being. Let me give it a different color. Okay, is this uh, equation one clear to everyone? Okay, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, now, we know, any question? No? X scale converges to X bar. So this implies F of X K L plus k over two norm of, or k l over two h x k l square okay this doesn't depend on k at all Okay, so on the right hand side, so I have a left hand side, this term, which depends on KL, and I have a right hand side, which does not depend on KL at all. So, so the left hand side is actually bounded from above. Now let's look at it carefully. So I have F of X KL, this would converge to F of X bar because KL converges to X bar. What about this term? So this is also a continuous function of X K L. So this would converge to alpha over two X bar minus X star square. Okay, so I have the first term which converges, this, the last term which converges on the right, on the left side. What happens to the middle term? Okay, so let's look at the middle term. What does this term converges to? So KL over two, what does this converge to? Infinity. Infinity. What does this converge to? Well, H is also continuous, so this converges to H of X bar square. 
what can we conclude from uh, these expressions? So this is finite value. This is finite value. This is uh, doesn't depend on KL, so it is also a finite value. One of the multiplier is going to infinity. So what does this imply for H of X bar? It has to be equal to zero. Yeah. So this must be equal to zero. Why would you say that? Because if that entire term is not um, zero, it would explode to infinity. Which would Correct. Not... Correct. Yeah. So it will explode to infinity and that's not possible. So this is always positive. H of X bar square, sorry, norm of H of X square is always positive. So it must go to zero. It can't go to minus infinity. So it must go to zero. Perfect. So what we have just shown is, let's go back to this figure. So we had the sequence X1, X2, X3, X4, and so on. And what we have shown is actually, there is a subsequence of this particular sequence which converges to X bar. Okay, so this converges to X bar and that X bar actually lies on this surface where H of X is equal to zero because we just showed that H of X bar is equal to zero. Okay, so X bar lies on this particular surface H of X equal to zero. Perfect. So we have f of x bar plus alpha over two x bar minus x star square is less than equal to f of x star. And moreover, x bar, it lies in the set of all x such that h of x equals to zero, or, or in other words, h of x bar is equal to zero. Uh, so when can this happen? So I am on the surface H of X equal to zero. And I, my original claim was that X star is a local minimum. Okay. And what I'm trying to say here is I have another point X bar such that F of X bar plus some positive number. So this term is positive multiplied by X bar minus X star square is actually less than equal to F of X star. So in other words, X bar is, uh, seems to be, seems to have much lower value than F of X star along that surface. How can that happen? Didn't we just say that X star is the optimal solution? It's a local minimum. Does this just mean that X bar is X star? Yes. So it means that X bar is X star. So why would you say that? You are right, but but uh, can you argue why this should be the case? Uh, so if we are seeing that, uh, you know, the value of uh, the value of the term at X bar is lower than what we are getting at X star. Right. And uh, we can say that X bar is X star. That's right. Yeah. Like then, yeah. Yeah. Because it has to be there. There has to be a single local minimum in that area. Um, yeah. So, so we claim that X bar is equal to X star. Perfect. So this is my equation number two. Uh, can you repeat the statement alone again? Right. So uh, let me uh, let me uh, show it to you. So this is my X star. And I know that X star is a local minimum along this particular surface. And I am claiming that I have a point X bar on the surface, which also is a local minimum along the surface. 
right? And we further had, um, if you remember, this X bar is a local minimum of So I have this equation uh, and then I have f of x star is less than equal to f of x bar uh, because of the fact that my x star was a local minimum of the function f on this surface, right? So I have these two inequalities. Okay, so this is, this is because x star is a local minimum by assumption. This is the second inequality. Oh, I shouldn't use a negative sign. So this inequality is because X star is a local minimum on this surface, H of X equal to zero. And this inequality is what we get here. And these two inequalities would imply that X bar is equal to X star. Otherwise it cannot happen because alpha is greater than zero. So these two inequalities imply X bar is equal to X star. Uh, you were not audible. Can you speak closer to the mic? Um, are we assuming that h of x is convex? Uh, no, we are not using any convexity assumption here. So h of x is some arbitrary function. Okay. So why couldn't there be two local minimums? Uh, right, it can have two local minimum, but remember that this alpha over two term has been added. Sorry, there has to be a square here. So alpha over two x bar minus x star or x minus x star makes it strongly convex in this region. Um, so so let, let's, let's, so you agree with the first statement because that's part of the proof we have done before. And this statement you agree with because uh, it's by assumption. This is by assumption, by hypothesis. So then I have f of x bar plus alpha over two x bar minus x star square is less than f of x star is less than f of x bar. So this implies alpha over two x bar minus x star square. Sorry, I am way over time now. Sorry, I didn't realize. This is less than equal to zero. This implies x bar is equal to x star. Okay, so this term has to be greater than equal to zero because this term is some norm square. So it has to be non-negative. And what we have just shown is that actually it is less than equal to zero. So therefore it must be zero and therefore X bar must be equal to X star. Okay, sorry, I'm way over time. So if you want to drop off, uh, feel free to do so. If you have questions uh, until now, please stay back and I can answer any questions you may have. Uh, professor, can I yes. ask uh, questions on the homework three? Uh, well, let me take the questions on the class. And if there are no questions on the class, then I can discuss homework three. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Seems like no question on the class. So yeah, we can discuss homework three. What's the question? Uh, okay. So, uh, so my first question is uh, for problem one. Uh, part A. So, uh, so in part in part A, it says uh, the matrix H is a positive definite matrix. Right. So I'm thinking is H also a symmetric mat matrix? Because if H is also symmetric, then I can like decompose H into a matrix transpose times another uh, times the matrix. Right. So. So by definition, a positive definite matrix has to be symmetric. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. so the way to solve this problem is as follows. You have H equals to U lambda U transpose where lambda is all the eigenvalues of H in a diagonal form. 
So you can define h raised to half as u lambda raised to half u transpose. So this is called the square root of a matrix. It's only defined for positive definite matrices or positive semi-definite matrices, square root of a matrix. And then whatever decomposition you have in mind will just will, will just work. Okay, so okay. this is the key step that you need to recognize. After that, everything is straightforward. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, for part B, so I just want to make sure. So it says uh, in the hint, it says we need to transform the problem in part A appropriately. Right. So, uh, so what I did is to uh, uh, expand the uh, the quadratic uh, uh, the quadratic uh, part in part mm -hmm. A, and then I do some like uh, uh, do some combination, uh, and then I just get to re remove a constant item from. Right. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's it's it's fairly straightforward once you recognize that you can take a square root of a square matrix of a positive definite matrix after that what you're saying works perfectly fine okay uh and then uh, i'm a little confused uh in part b below below the hint it says for the following question assume x b and a but I think the the value of x, b, and a here is not supposed to use in part b because there is no such b here. So I think this value. Oh, is there is a, there is an equation number one or equation number two. I don't know what equation it is. And there you, I give you like x equals to three, four, five, a equals to some matrix, b equals to some vector. Do you see that? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so equation two is used for. Uh, I don't know what it's used for. So it's used for, you know, in part D or maybe C or D. Let me just check. Used for x bar. It defines x bar in part D. So I'm so oh, you are talking about part B? Uh, right, part B. Oh, I see. Okay, sorry. I was I was looking at part C. Okay. Yeah, so in part B, what was your question? So I, I have uh, a question paper, the assignment in front of me. So the equation two, the value of X, B, and A, uh, are we supposed to use these uh, three values and in put it into uh, the, the expression of X bar? Oh, no, 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 no. So this is, so before equation two, you see for the following question, so the following question is part C and then question number two, two C, I think. Oh, okay. So, so equation two is used for part C and then below. And two C. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so far, so far uh, part C, we need to put in the values in equation two to get the final answer. So I'll leave it up to you. There is an easier way to do the projection and there is a more complicated way. The more complicated way is to look at part B and, uh, and, and do it that way. And uh, the less complicated way is uh, stare at the equation for long enough and you get the answer. Okay, I see. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my final question uh, is for problem four. Problem four, yeah, sure. Uh, so for problem four, uh, uh, like in part A, it says uh, there are a hundred inequality constraints and a one equality constraint. Correct. So uh, I'm thinking for the a hundred inequality constraint, it should be they use the uh, the maximum uh, right. value 
and right. then it should be non-negative. But right. uh, but I'm not very sure about the in about the equality constraint. So equality constraint I, would be supply equals demand. Oh, it should be just the total supply equal the total demand. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then for part B, we just uh, uh, put uh, use this in equality constraint correct. to eliminate it. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a question. Perfect. Any other question on assignment three? Um. No. Uh, I. Oh. <laughs> there is a is collision of packages in the network. Could you uh, uh, guide with 1B? I have no idea how to proceed with 1B. Oh, 1B, okay. Uh, let's see. So I have the following problem. I want to minimize half X minus X bar transpose h x minus x bar oh this is in part a so i've already solved this problem so this problem is solved um, now in part a now i have a problem half x transpose h x minus c transpose x And I want to minimize such that AX equals to B. The the thing that you showed earlier with uh, with the square root of H, right. is that for part A or part B? I think that is useful in part A, not in part B. But let me let me double check. Okay, so I have X transpose HX. X transpose H X bar. You know, I'll have to look at my solutions because I forgot how I did part B. Okay. Uh, why don't you send me an email? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll do it. And I will, I'll reply to your email, whatever, uh, what I was thinking about when I was writing that equation. Okay. Um, any other question? There was another question on assignment. Yeah, I had one question. You can go ahead. Oh, thank you. So uh, for uh, problem 2C, uh, we are asked to project uh, X onto capital X. Correct. Uh, with some constraints. Right. So, uh, do we have to use the function that we are supposed to minimize in 2B in any way for problem C? Oh, uh, you just have to use the code, but the function that you're going to minimize is X minus Y square. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, uh, the code that we have for 2B, we just right. need to change uh, the objective function. That's right. That's right. And the constraint set, of course. Yeah, and the constraints. Yeah. So, yeah. like, basically, uh, right. the, the section of code, length yeah. prog that has to change. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Professor, I just had a question on part one C. Um, so, all of these. Um, capital X are uh, different sets, basically. We just, right. you know, okay, those are three solutions, basically, not an intersection of the three. Uh, three different solutions, yes. Yep, okay. Just wanted to verify. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Uh, professor. Yes. Uh, in today's class, at the end of today's class, you you said uh, th that uh, 
what what function is this strong strongly convex? I I missed that part. Ah, so so which function is strongly convex? So f k of x uh, is strongly convex around x star because of this. Uh, let me go up where I define it because of this term. You see this term? Ah, uh, yes. So because of which around x star fk of x is strongly convex. This capital fk of x. I see. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other question? I had a question on the manifold sub optimization algorithm. Yes. In the, in the second step of the algorithm, you had said that if D is not equal to zero, then we uh, look at mu j bar uh, Correct. for constraint mu j bar is less than zero. Now the expression for mu that you gave us in the class it did not explicitly have a dependence on j. So is that just a k with j removed? Is that how it's dependent on mu? Uh, so here is the expression. So yeah. mu is a vector. Yeah. Right. So you look at a vector and one of the elements in that vector will be negative. It's just the j element. Okay. Right. So that's the vector. That's the index you want to remove from your matrix a k. Right. Does that does that uh, help you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And you know the the way to remove a remove a row from a matrix, right? So yeah, you set it equal to empty. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, no further questions. So I'm going to upload the video in about fifteen minutes. Thank you.